You're listening to Death of the Reader, Flex and Herds here for your Murder Mystery World Tour, and we are back in our second week discussing John Dixon Carr's The Crooked Hinge with our good friend Brad Freeman from Our Sweet Mystery. Brad, it's good to have you back. I'm glad to be back, you guys. We are covering chapter 7 to 13. There are automatons abound, mystery bazaar, and... One large detective. I <laughs> am frightened to pitch my theory today. Oh, no. <laughs> Yeah, I, oh my goodness. I love that we finally get to meet Dr. Gideon Fell. Yes. And his assistant. We have so many detectives in this novel. I don't know how to keep track. Good grief. It's kind of fun because like Dr. Gideon Fell is like the detective of the story, but we have Mm. Inspector Elliot Elliot. and then Paige is also trying to figure things out. And then everyone else is like trying to muscle in on Fell's territory. It's so fun. And Murray. Yeah, oh. and Murray. And there's like this, this turf war between who gets to be the real detective. It's fantastic. Well, yeah. that happens a lot in in Carr, that about six people seem to gather in a room and talk and talk and talk about yeah. what's going on. They all sort of connect together. It's great. And, and that just adds to some of the layers sometimes. I will yeah. say this. I didn't read this. Uh, I didn't read Carr in order in any way, shape or form. And I can never keep track with all the secondary people. The only... The only other policeman <laughs> I'm really aware of is is uh, Hadley, because Inspector Hadley from Scotland Yard was in a lot of the early stuff. But what I didn't realize is that Elliot, who I like very much here, is in the next um, Fell book, uh, The Black Spectacles or The um, Problem of the Green Capsule, which is another favorite of mine. And, and, and because he's there, unless Brian Page, and I'm not saying this won't happen, unless Brian Page turns out to be really evil... <laughs> I'm not quite sure I what, mean. <laughs> what his point of being there is as that kind of young man looking into the case that is often in a car story because Elliot yeah. will fill that so well. well. Well, thankfully, like as you were saying, there's so many detectives in, in cars stories. Thankfully, he takes the time to outline when a character no longer fulfills a purpose. <laughs> Murray says explicitly, I feel like once I produce my piece of evidence, I cease to matter, which I think is very helpful. <laughs> I, I like what you're saying about how uh, Elliot kind of stands in that young man role to to Fell's old man role, uh, and how Page, like, how does how does Brian Page fit into all this? But I, I've definitely noticed Madeline Dane seems to have her uh, metaphorical claws in him emotionally. It's I'm excited to see how that. It's plays very out. bizarre <laughs> because John Dixon Carr. Uh, often goes to lengths to not objectify mm. women, but then like repetitively congratulates himself for doing so. Oh my and it goodness. has almost the opposite effect. I, I have always had a problem with cars, women. Um, <laughs> some of them are very admirable, but they are objects. I, and there's yeah. nothing about car that you can say uh, differentiates from some of the problematic treatment of women of the day. Yeah. And that's in book after book. Yeah. What was the line? Uh, Damn me, but I did notice her figure and it was a good figure. <laughs> Something along those lines. What a terrible line. <laughs> yes. Um, but I also just wanted to ask you, because we might as well start this out. Fell and Elliot are there because, not because of John Farnley, but because mm. of Victoria Daly. So the yeah. case of Victoria Daly with the murder of, by the tramp yep. is picking on a new... I hope you see importance here. I wondered what you guys made of that. Oh, goodness. On, on the one hand, I'm very curious because I feel like you've you've played us into a trap here where section three of the four sections we're going to get in this book is going to be about the daily case, but I don't want to accuse you of treating us unfairly because I think there are like clues in here. Yeah. We know, for example, that a young Farnley took his dear girls, whoever they happened to be at the time, promiscuous as he was, to like gypsy camps. So I don't know, maybe that's what we're pinning that on, but I don't know. I don't remember the arsenic, but I do remember the atropine. And, and oh, it was atropine. Yeah. I might be right. Guys, yeah, that might be the no, one. No, I'm not going to tell you anymore because you're going to have to do your research. But <laughs> atropine and belladonna are. They make a lot of appearances in golden age detective fiction. They are favorites of Agatha Christie, my favorite author. Mm. And if you don't know about Atropine and Belladonna, as you go further, I think you might be doing it to yourselves a disadvantage, but then they're my points. <laughs> <laughs> you can, you can pin it on anything. Herds. I'll just see this because mm-hmm. I'm like a year or two older than you. <laughs> when I saw what was covering her body, I knew exactly what was going on. So that's just something to tell you. And I am, I know I'm giving 
the whole thing away, but I'm not going to go any further. <laughs> yeah, I suppose the other thing that was fun, of course, was this section is called The Life of an Automaton, and we get to The Life of an Automaton, and... You know, we've spoken about the uh, the scientific devices that were were not permitted to use complicated in ones in yeah. mystery by dear Sir Father Ronald Knox. Yeah, well, I, there's a wonderful moment toward the end where they kind of open it and they're like, "There's so many like clockworks and gears and gizmos." And they're like, "What do we do with this?" I yeah, mean, and they want to <laughs> take it out and figure out if they can figure out how to make it work. And Patrick Gore says, "If anybody can figure out how this works, because it is." Yeah. Been- the story of my life wanting to figure out how this works. I will pay them a, a fortune. Any any man, woman, or child, he says. The fact that it's there is is curious to begin with. We spend <laughs> so much time with it when it seems to have done nothing yet. Well, as far as we know, but yeah. Well, it, it does roll down the stairs at the end. Yes. Uh, so whether that's by, you know, its own machinations or someone giving a swift kick, We'll have to figure that one out. But and it uh flies down the stairs past Dr. Fell. So is it trying to get yep. Dr. Fell or does it want Dr. Fell out of the way so it can go into the bedroom and go after the main? <laughs> and terrifying. Poor Betty. Poor Betty. Poor Betty gets another another attack by the gold. It feels so hat. bad. We haven't even she's not even a real character. We haven't seen her on screen and she's having the worst time. Yeah, that was a portion where I was like, is Betty a nickname for another character in this story? Um <laughs> She seems like a comedic device, so I don't know if that's gonna factor into it, but like I'm I'm ready. I'm ready for Betty. <laughs> well, I, I also just for Betty's sake, I love, you know, I've, I've mentioned, I think last time, I love that every chapter ends with a big bum, bum, bum. Mm, mm. And one of them says they found the core of an apple. Yeah. Bum, oh, bum, goodness. Bum. Betty's apple, maybe, or some mm. other apple. Is well, that a big clue or is that a red or green, depending on the variety herring? You don't know. It's true. We need to figure out what color the apple was. And thus we will find out who the killer is. It makes sense. Um, <laughs> nah, I, I love in this story how many different, you, you spoke in, you know, red herrings is something you're bringing up, Noah, green herrings. Uh, there are so many different things going on in this house. Like there's the automaton, there's the Satanism, there's the spooky garden. There seems to be a monster yes. crawling around the garden. Apparently. Um, which we saw through the window. The, the murder has occurred, but now you find out there are actual witnesses. There were people standing on balconies. Knowles the butler mm. was standing on the balcony looking down at the garden. Um, mm. Burroughs saw things. Um, Molly was in a position where she could see things. And nobody yeah. saw anything except John seemingly struggling, seemingly falling. and uh, Throws his hands in the air. His yeah. hands in the air. So mm. what what attacked him? What killed him? Yeah, yeah. The, the wound is described as like fangs or claws maybe being raked across his throat, which I think is really cool. The three slashes, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, the, the other thing I love about it is that when we find all of this out, it's not that we're sitting down and interrogating the witnesses. It's that we're going over written statements that Dr. Gideon Fell has been presented with for the most part, you know, with a couple of exceptions like Knowles. I love that like separation from the normal interrogation that we get of our suspects because it's like it, it's a lot more dry in the one sense but it also means that we get to see so much more of fell when he's been absent for the rest of the novel as soon as fell gets on the scene he starts saying i don't know everything right now i'm not i'm not going to be foolish enough to, to to say i know everything but he makes a series of declarative statements that we can take uh as as guidance for how we want to solve the the murder right which I think is really, yeah. it's really cool. I, I feel like you could twist it either way in that either he's making declarative statements to try and bait something out of someone sure. or he sure. actually believes them, but there's no concrete way to tell unless you're familiar with Fell's character in the other books. Sure, sure. Well, so the first thing he says is that we need to know who the real John is. And yes. then pretty quickly he says, it seems clear from the way mm. everyone's behaved that the real John is Patrick Gore. So- yeah. Is that true? I absolutely think so. Yeah, I'd agree. I've thought so from the beginning, but listen, we should we should wrap this portion of the discussion here so that I can come back and- <laughs> That's a good teaser. <laughs> destroy Herds' mind. Oh no. And hopefully leave Brad in a fit of giggles. I'm worried, I'm worried. Okay. <laughs> Anyhow, this is Death of the Reader, your Murder Mystery World Tour here on 2SER 107.3. We are discussing John Dixon Carr's The Crooked Hinge, chapters 7 to 13, and we'll be back with more of that in just a second. You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex here with you. 
The latest metafictional monstrosity to grace the shores of my bookshelf is Everyone in My Family Has Killed Someone. In celebration, I'm joined by the author Benjamin Stevenson, who uh, last we had on for his thriller Either Side of Midnight. It's a pleasure to have you back, and I am delighted to have another Knox disciple in our ranks. Welcome back to Death of the Reader. Thank you. Thanks for having me back. I've never been described as a metafictional monstrosity before, so I quite like that. <laughs> so we spoke a little bit of last time about morbidity and humor, and it feels only natural to me that your comedy eventually found its firm footing in this book of crime and grisly things. What got you thinking metafictional playing on the Knox Decalogue? You know, I was writing quite serious rural noir crime novels before this one. But I was writing this one at the start of 2020, and I just felt like I didn't want to write something too gloomy. And, you know, I've got a background in, in comedy, but I've always kept that out of my books. And I, I realised I was sort of holding back one of my main strengths because I... I don't know, because I wanted the two things to be separate. And and then when I started rereading, you know, all the Christies and stuff, they're fun. They're supposed to be fun. You know, one of the things of crime novels is that the readers are supposed to have fun for long and, and fun solving it. You want to give your reader a pat on the back when they, when they solve your mystery. And I thought that comedy in crime can be very difficult and very easy to ruin a crime novel. If you have a comic plot... The problem that you run into is it turns into farce. And so this is a crime novel and has a crime novel's plot and a crime novel's engine. In terms of where did the metafiction come from, it's because I wanted a, a unique narrator and I wanted his book, but I still wanted to deliver a really good mystery. And so I thought to have him speak in this unique way was the solution to to writing a light book that was still a really good mystery novel that wasn't a farce. You caused a bit of chaos for e-readers like myself in page-numbered foreshadowing or spoilers of events to come in the novel. How do you keep all of that straight when it's going through writing, editing, typesetting, publishing, potentially translations? You know, what's the process for keeping a handle on the unique and complex type of clue that you decided to pitch into this book? So I wanted to put page numbers in the book that sort of signify events that are sort of coming up or or are happening because it's a book that knows it's a book. And, you know, what better way to do that than to draw attention to the physical book in people's hands by telling them this page 110, et cetera, et cetera. I had a big Excel spreadsheet and I checked at every stage that people um, would seat. So every time something got moved, I had to sort of, uh, I have to check it because I'm the only one that knows it and some of them are very subtle and my spreadsheet is terrifying and <laughs> supplied it to everyone and they're equally terrified by it. So, um, yeah, sort of on me to keep it straight. It's very difficult. But there's actually separate book, the ebook and the audio book, all have slightly different wording so that they work in the format. You know, the audio book, he, he doesn't say page numbers. He says, oh, you're about five minutes away, um, <laughs> depending on how fast you listen to it. So, you know, I've I've made sure that it does work in all formats because that was tricky. Yeah. The the vibe that I got from Ern through this novel, who he, he like won't let you forget that he is in his own crime novel, and the way that you portray his understanding at points almost to me felt like uh the parts of like horror films where you see characters make the decisions you know that are going to get them killed. And you're like, if this was in any other film, this action would be fine. But like, come on, you're in a horror film. Have you not figured it out yet? And I, I guess, was it fun with you playing with that relationship, the metafictionality of Ern, knowing almost what you were about to throw at him? How did that kind of play out for you? Yeah, it was super fun. I mean, there's a lot to unpack in that question. It's fantastic. You've so many pieces of it on the head. First of all, the horror connection. You know, I think that sort of horror is underrated in the way in which it's contributed to, to crime fiction. And specifically this book, you know, one of the things I compare it to is Scream, you know, that kind of knowing they know what's coming and, and they know that they're in it kind of thing, which hasn't really been done for crime fiction. And when you, you, when, you know, you think about Scream, it's actually got levels of, you know, literary techniques and, and the things they're doing there are, are really clever, especially for the time, you know, sequels notwithstanding whether they, they maintained <laughs> it. But, and how it feels to give that to Ernest is drawing attention to the fact that this is a book in first person and everyone who writes crime novels in first persons, credit to them because it's so hard to do suspense when the very fact that the book's in first person physically means that the kid must survive to write it down. You know, so why would I write it like the narrative pretending like they don't know what's coming and it's all chronological? 
why don't I actually embrace the artifice that that the character has to sit down and write the book rather than the book just emerging? It's also such a classic yeah, mystery no. thing to do. Like I'm thinking there, there are so many classic crime fiction novels where the fact that the book is written ends up being a clue that the author like never tells you but is implicit to the text. And it's kind of fun that in a completely different approach, you've returned to that same idea that was so prevalent in the genre that you're parodying. Absolutely. You know, it's often... That's part of a twist. And, and, you know, going all the way back, you know, that's why Watson writes Sherlock Holmes' stories and they're in first person, but that's because Watson is himself unpacking his admiration of what's happened and so his cluelessness sort of sort of comes across as he's doing it and it feels a bit more real time. One of the things I'm proudest of is that I can tell you in this book that somebody dies on page 50 and instead of feeling like you're just reading up to the bit where someone dies, it's actually more suspenseful, I hope, anyway. I mean, it's also, it's so good because of the fact that Ernest is writing it as a writer. He's not writing it down to, like, get his thoughts out. He's like, I am here to entertain and create suspense on my own as a character. So you have these, like, layers of commitment to creating a good story for the audience that allows you to do something you just really couldn't with a more conventional, you know, Watson-style diary-type writer. Yeah, absolutely. And also, he's not that good. You know, like, he's not a published <laughs> writer. A lot of people in these in in novels, you know, Stephen King does it a lot. His characters are writers, and they're always very, very good writers. And they might be experiencing writer block, or you know, they might be constructing their next novel. But there's always that sort of history, and they're always the bestseller. And so I knew when I told my agent that my main character was a writer, she literally sighed. She's like, "Oh God, main characters <laughs> as writers are so hard." And so. You know, he's not really a writer. He's never published a book. He reads a lot and he publishes these these crummy books mm -hmm. that he sells for 99 cents on the internet and he thinks he knows a lot about crime. But, yeah, that was really key to his character is that he's not a best-selling crime writer writing a crime novel that he's found himself in. He's a rubbish crime writer, which was really fun. Now, I guess the next thing I wanted to do was spiral us back to uh, Knox's Commandments a little bit because I cannot say how many of Knox's Commandments, aside from the 11th, that you do or do not break in the novel since that's one of the charming questions readers, I think, will delight in asking themselves through. But there's a discussion about a third of the way through the novel where Juliet and Ern are talking about how modern novels kind of shred the rules why do you think that there's that sense in modern writing where we have to challenge the rules and can't kind of work with them? Look, I think it's I think it is a natural evolution, and I think that um, several big books did big to the fences swings with um, the type of rule breaking that wouldn't have played in the 1930s in the Golden Age, and those books are like Gone Girl and girl on a train and stuff, and, and the birth of the unreliable narrator. I've got no complaints with that type of fiction, but I was very aware that it was sort of the modern norm. I feel like modern psychological thrillers with those kind of twists in them, they've become about the author playing the reader, which is a lot of fun, but classic 1930s golden age crime is more about the author playing along with the reader that's the pure reason I rebelled against it. And also just because it's, you know, there's a lot out there and I wanted to sort of try and be different. And Yeah, I, I really, as I said before we began this interview, you made a novel for me and that's kind of exactly, I think, the summary of how. You put together a novel that brings the best of these like modern ideas of playing with the very nature of the fiction we deal with and just makes it as classic as it possibly can without taking that seriously. Because that's the charm of Knox's rules to me is that even though they're kind of a good guidepost, they're also very tongue-in-cheek, and you really captured that, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I break a couple of them in, <laughs> in unique ways. Most of them hold together, and, and some of them I point out, hey, I'm breaking this right now. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, yeah, you know, you play it with, with an earnestness, a respect, and a tongue-in-cheek, I think, was what I was hoping to do. Anyway, Benjamin, it has been fantastic having you back on Death of the Reader, and I cannot more wholeheartedly recommend everyone in my family has killed someone. You have basically written the book for our audience, and it's been such a treat speaking with you about it. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm so glad you've enjoyed it, and I'll, uh, I'll look forward to the chatting about the next one with you. I cannot wait. You're listening to Death of the Reader, Benjamin Stevenson there talking about his novel, Everyone in My Family Has Killed Someone. We'll have links up on the podcast if you want to get yourself a copy. And thank you to his publishers for sending one over to us. Stick around, more to come. You're on Death of the Reader.
You're listening to Death of the Reader, Flex, Herds, and Brad Freeman from Our Sweet Mystery, here for your Murder Mystery World Tour, discussing John Dixon Carr's The Crooked Hinge, chapters 7 to 13. Brad is challenging Herds and I mm. to make a fool of ourselves in front of all of you <laughs> over one of his favorite murder mysteries of all time. Listen, Brad, I don't know where you want to start, but I- Can we just get into the murder? Can we just go there? You, you have to do that. I mean, the, the, the problem with John Dixon Carr is you can't just tell us who did it. Um, and, and sometimes I don't even know if he bothers to tell you why, but you have, to, you have to get into the how of it. This is a very tricky little puzzle mm. here because unlike the locked room mysteries that he's so famous for, there is no locked room. It's a wide open spaces. Everything points to both murder and suicide being pretty much impossible. So mm. unless it was an act of, of the occult or divine intervention. Oh, obviously. No. <laughs> what it was God. happened to John Farnley in that garden? And then yeah. you have to figure out who did that. Yeah. I'm sorry, who done that? Who 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 or what? Or what done that? Well, yes. clearly. Yeah, Hertz, I'd love to hear your theory. Let me let me talk about some things here. So there, there's a couple of things that I thought were kind of interesting. I think that we're leaning on the the Patrick Gore done it situation here. The two big things that we find in the, in the, the like end of the, the the last couple of chapters here are the apple on the floor that Gore like kicks away and the automaton going down the stairs, which I think that Gore has just kicked that down the stairs. He's been here for all the like weird stuff that's been going on. And in terms of the murder, I think it's very clear. We, we talked about his being a circus performer. One of the like classic circus tricks uh, is is like the throwing knife trick. Yeah, he, he like he like went to catch it or something. You're saying that's why his hands went up. I don't, well, I don't know. Maybe he was like trying to block the knife. I think what you're saying is that Patrick Gore threw the knife, slashed John Farnley three Just times the on the neck. It's got the three parts though. They say it has like the corkscrew and the the bit for getting the thing for cleaning a horse's the, hoof. Yeah, the horse's hoof bit. Yeah, it's it like it's like, like spinning through the air. Yeah, he like took it out. It's a, it it ha- yeah, it would have to sure. be a pretty strong gravity. throw to get it that far. We're, we're relying. I have no issue with this on the power of gravity and physics. <laughs> Flex, I can see you. I can see you smirky in the corner there. Do you have an objection? Listen, I just want to say, I think he's got no legs. What do you mean he's got no legs? Gore? I think Gore has no legs. Keep going. What do you? Hold on. Is that why he's? <laughs> is that why he's kicking everything? Oh, That's why he's Explain kicking this. everything. Is huh? that why he's kicking everything to prove that he has the use of his legs? <laughs> Can you elaborate on this for me? Why do you think he has no legs? Okay. Tell me. When, Tell when me Patrick Gore first walks onto the scene, we're told that his walk is clumsy, to say the least. Oh, no. We, we can explain uh, the crime in any of number of ways, throwing, like, you know, throwing knives, fishing, fishing hooks, line. Yeah. some small cat coming up and clawing his throat. But the one thing we can't really explain that is that monkey. The, the face that Welkin saw at the like lower oh, window. You mean when when Welkin says he sees something dead crawling through the underbrush, is that gore? Yes. Oh my goodness, that's insane. That's gore with his legs. You see, off. now that you're saying that, that actually makes so much sense because you know what that would make him? Yeah. The size of a child. Exactly. And in the when they're talking about the automaton, they say only a child who could fit in the back of the automaton or whatever would be able to pilot it. Yeah, they, and he they specifically have that entire says, sequence. He says, hold on, Flex, hold on. I'm holding. He says, I will give money to any man, woman- Or child. Or child who is able to pilot the automaton. Oh, that's it, Flex. Oh, no. Okay, <laughs> I, could, I can terrible. go on, Herds. I can go Please, on. We go continue. through this entire geometry puzzle of where Knowles is standing and he can look down. Knowles <laughs> says he sees Patrick standing outside the window. Pray tell, let's just say that you've met this man, Patrick Gore, and you happen to, I don't know, see his pants without a torso, and you think you've gone nuts. So you just say, oh yeah, I saw him standing outside the window, because you have no better explanation. How could a man have legs but no body? So Knowles thinks he saw Patrick Gore standing six feet tall, looking in the window and watching and watching Murray with the thumbograph. But what he actually saw but didn't register was like three foot tall Patrick Gore crouched at the bottom of the window and he just sort of didn't notice the three foot. I mean, listen, of- Brad, if you were just walking the streets of lovely California and just happened to see a pair of unbodied legs, what would your first assumption be? Yeah. All the time. I'll, you should see the legless people walking up and down the street <laughs> where I am in sunny California. I, I just want to say, it's a Knowles thing. It's a character thing. He says, 
I want you to be very assured that what I say is what I saw. That entire interrogation is very hung up on the idea that I want to convince you that I still have good eyesight and I am telling the truth. And I think in the back of his mind, he's thinking, well, I'll say everything that I am sure of. And if I'm not sure of something, I'll cover it up with what I think is the truth. And the, the only other person we haven't explained is Molly because she's into it. <laughs> she, she's in on it, right? Right? Am I, am I crazy here? Molly's in on this. Why? Where? How? This is where I start to lose the chain of thought here, because it's last okay. week I said it would be very silly for Patrick Gore to come back and Molly to be like, oh, goodness, my childhood love. I think Molly has done something that either the defendant, John Farnley, or Patrick Gore is holding against her that has encouraged her to participate in this. The only unexplained thing in the story that has been done we haven't used is the death of Victoria Daly. Yeah, let, let's get into that because I, I mentioned the apple and I want to talk about the significance of the apple that Gore kicks away because it is evidence. Mm. Um, I think that the apple has been poisoned. I think that in this story where we have all these monsters and a witch in the future and automatons, I think that we're relying on the fairy tale story of uh, of Snow White and the Poison Apple. I believe it specifically says that it, it has been half eaten or has a bite taken out of it. Mm. That visual metaphor seems very clear to me. Yeah. And I think that Betty, who uh, was knocked unconscious by fright, I think it's poison. My understanding of the details of Victoria Daly's uh, mm. death is that she was killed by the tramp. That's what we're told, yes. That, right. And that the tramp, I mean, after the tramp killed her and ran off, it was being chased and he died. In it, like Off the screen. train hit him or something like that. Yeah. Yes, something I don't. Like I don't think that the tramp actually killed her. I think that it's a setup. I think that another character killed her. And you're suggesting that the person who killed her also killed the tramp. I would say whoever killed Daly also killed the tramp to try and pin the murder on them. And why was why was Victoria Daly killed? I I'm I'm trying to tie it back into the main case. I've got to say that either Molly was involved in the death of Victoria Daly and. Farnley held it over her and she's now participated in his death to get away from that blackmail or Patrick Gore knows it and is using it as a blackmail. I mean, the thing about you guys is when you divide these books in such a way that you're like in, thir in thirds and the next third, the last third is so chock full of stuff that mm. we can't talk about. I mean, so I'm That's just, okay. I'm, I think this is going to be very, fun for you oh yeah it's spooky and when he wants to be spooky car does a really good job i love the image of welkin sitting there stuffing sandwiches in his face and he looks down and he sees this face yeah looking up and just let me let me get my my paper to compute what points i'm gonna give you guys. i know <laughs> i'm so nervous i can, i feel <laughs> we're so close but yeah, because the I stipulation agree. is that brad can be as petty as he wants we could no walk points. away with nothing <laughs> I am looking forward to it. I welcome zero points. As long as Brad, I need to tell you, as long as you don't specifically call me out for any wrongdoing, I'll be I'll be fine with zero points. <laughs> Just use the royal we, even though everything is my fault. Just do that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, look. Brad, I suppose we should probably wrap this there and then you can come back next week and <laughs> Dish out oh, our wow. punishment for the many yeah, sins exactly. we've committed here. You could very well be rewarded, oh. you guys. I think you're very, very clever. Thank you. Clever, clever young men. You might get lots of reward. You never know. <laughs> I don't like the way you said that. That hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, it's not the crushing of my legs on the deck of the Titanic. I was. Oh, we didn't even get to that. One more question, please. We didn't even what, get to that. what? What is the crooked hinge? Crap! Is it something? Is it his legs? Is it? A, is it a hinge <laughs> it, in his legs? Is it his legs? Do, do his? Is that why he's walking with a with a limp? Hold on! Does he have a hinge in his legs? That's why he's walking with a limp because if he walked normally, it would make a yes. sound. Would yes. it make a creaking sound? Pinocchio Gore. Yes, <laughs> he is now a real boy. Oh, I'm so happy. Okay, <laughs> I love this. I love this show. Thanks, Brad. You've been an excellent, excellent expert this week. Good I grief. I so much fun with you. <laughs> it has to be. We're going to hear the hinge creak. It's going to be the nail in the coffin. I'm so ready. All righty. This is your Murder Mystery World Tour. We are discussing John Dixon Carr's The Crooked Hinge. Next week, all the way to the end, all the spoilers, all the answers. 
Look forward to seeing you then on your murder mystery world tour. You're listening to 2SER 107.3.